OA1, the hits. Hello, and welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ana Mateo. This program is for English learners, so we speak a bit slower. And our stories are written especially for people learning English. Here are the stories we have for you on today's program. First, the education report. Dan Friedel talks about how a robotic program is returning to in person working. I will return with words and their stories. This week, I talk about expressions from a trouble causing animal. Then, Dan Novak will share a story from China and a new rule aimed at limiting kids' computer time. Ashley Thompson will talk about migration around the world. Dan Friedel will return with another story about China. But first, here is the education report. On an afternoon in early September, Carnegie Mellon University was busy with students, even though it was raining outside. The grounds of the school on Forbes Avenue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, were different. Than they were in September 2020. Last year, the university was empty after COVID 19 restrictions kept most students home. After a year with many students working from home, places to eat and study were once again filled with people, all wearing face coverings indoors. Last September, Zach Manchester was in his first year as an assistant professor at the school's Robotics Institute. Carnegie Mellon is known for its science and technology programs. Manchester came to Pennsylvania from Stanford University in California, where he taught aeronautics or flight science. Manchester communicated through video links throughout the 2020 2021 school year with one of his former Stanford students. They worked on a project that developed a series of small satellites known as CubeSats. The satellites each weigh about one kilogram. Manchester watched as Max Holliday built the CubeSats in his kitchen in California. Manchester said Holliday was doing pretty heroic, insane things with trying to get the satellite stuff to fly. The three person team got the satellites ready so they could be included on a SpaceX rocket. That launched from Cape Canaveral in Florida on January 24th, 2021. Once in orbit, the satellites work together as a group to do things like take photos and communicate using radio signals. Given the circumstances, we did a pretty good job of getting the work done, Manchester said. Now, Manchester looks back on that time. Could the satellite project have gone better with more in person testing? Yes. Did it work out well enough? Yes. We built some satellites and got them into space with like a three person team with one person doing almost all of the hardware work、uh, from his kitchen. All things considered, I think we pulled off something that is pretty impressive that we got it to happen. Now that he and his new students are working together in Pittsburgh, the first goal is to catch up on real world work. Manchester and his students spent most of 2021 writing computer instructions and making computer based predictions of how robots and drones move. 
These are called computer simulations. Now they have to find out if their predictions were correct by testing them with real robots in the laboratory. Manchester said he is never surprised when robots faceplant or crash the first time out. And this is, this is known in the, in the field as the sim to real gap. You know, the simulators are cool, but they don't really reflect reality ever. And uh, there's always little extra gotchas when you try to do something in the real world. Manchester said he and his students were able to get a lot of work done by video, even if some were working outside of the U.S. in their home countries. By the summer, they completed most of the programming and simulation. By September, even his students who had been outside the U.S. were in Pittsburgh. That permits his lab to make a pretty big push into getting our stuff up and running on real hardware this fall, he said. In the courtyard outside the Robotics Institute, Bart Deisteroff, a PhD student from the Netherlands, talked with VOA about his goals. He wants to find a way to reduce the cost of robots so the average person can buy one and make life more like a sci-fi movie. Sci-fi is short for science fiction, meaning imaginative movies or books about the future. He once worked in aerospace, but moved to Carnegie Mellon to learn more about computer science and robotics. Deisteroff also said he wants to test his ideas in the real world. Because maybe we're just designing something that only works in the simulator. And if we discover 20 years from now, then that's a pretty big problem. Evan Cohen is a master's student from Pittsburgh. He said he is excited about getting back to work in person because scientists often solve problems by accident. While video calls help people stay in touch, he said, they do not let scientists look around a lab and see what other people are working on. It is much better to be on campus where students and professors can talk about their projects in buildings and at places to eat. A lot of stuff I think is just working side by side with someone and just something just kind of comes up out of nowhere. I think for me, that's some of the biggest breakthroughs I've had is oh. just you get an idea you didn't have before. What's something like that? Cohen explained that he and his classmates were trying to help a robot to sense barriers. When meeting by video, they could not fix the problem. However, when they met in person and started tinkering with the robot it was easier to guess and check their ideas. I had a whole year online, so I'm glad to experience a semester in person, he said. I'm Dan Friedel. Thanks, Dan. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we will explore English expressions. On today's program, we talk about animal expressions. English has many animal expressions, too many to name. Also, in English, as in many other languages, some animals have come to have certain reputations. That is to say... They are known for certain behaviors. For example, dogs are loyal. We often call them man's best friend. Cats are independent and mysterious. In old stories, snakes and foxes are not to be trusted. Turtles do things slowly, 
while rabbits are full of energy. Then there are monkeys. Monkeys have a reputation for being silly and causing trouble. Good words for that are naughty and mischievous. Monkeys are especially known for being fun, and if one monkey is fun, just think how much fun many monkeys would be. If an activity or event is super fun, we can say it is as fun as a barrel of monkeys. Even a fun person can be described as a barrel of monkeys. Now, a barrel is a large wooden container. I'm not sure how to get monkeys into a barrel, but I'm guessing it would be fun. While we are on the subject, keep in mind that fun and funny are used differently. If something is funny, it makes you laugh. If something is fun, it is simply enjoyable. For example, last weekend I went to a party and it was really fun. At the party, my friend told me a funny story and I laughed out loud. Some word historians think that the expression "barrel of monkeys" was first recorded in 1895. It describes the playful behavior of these primates. We use it to describe any type of fun activity or person. To call something a barrel of monkeys is definitely informal. You could also call a really fun event a riot. Where I grew up in West Virginia, people might call something really fun a hoot. That is also informal and a bit rural. Now monkeys do more than have fun, because they are also smart. They are known for causing trouble, so it is not surprising. That we have monkey expressions that describe causing trouble. The first is to simply monkey around. To monkey around means to goof around or cause harmless trouble. But it could lead to more serious trouble. So a parent may warn a child: If you monkey around, someone could get hurt. So stop it. If I make a funny joke at a work meeting, someone could tell me to stop monkeying around and get serious. Our last expression is monkey business. Monkey business usually means dishonest activities. For example, most people expect a little monkey business in politics. It just seems to come with the territory, as we like to say. Here at VOA Learning English, we don't monkey around with English. We take it very seriously. We are all business, but not, you know, monkey business. That would be bad. And that's all the time we have for this words and their stories. Until next time, I'm Anna Mateo. Now let's hear from Dan Novak. China has set new rules limiting the amount of time children can play online games. The restrictions limit children to just three hours of online game playing a week. That is one hour between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday most weeks. Li Zhangguo has two children, ages four and eight. Even though they do not have smartphones. They enjoy playing online games. 
If my children get their hands on our mobile phones or an iPad, and if we don't closely monitor their screen time, they can play online games for as long as three to four hours each time, he said. Like many other parents, Lee is happy with new government restrictions. But experts say it is unclear if such policies can help prevent addiction to online games. Children might just get addicted to social media instead. In the end, experts say, parents should be the ones to set limits and support good practices. There has been a growing concern in China about gaming addiction among children. Government reports in 2018 found that about 1 in 10 Chinese children were addicted to the Internet. The new rules are part of an effort to prevent young people from spending too much time on entertainment that communist officials consider unhealthy. That includes what officials call the irrational fan culture surrounding celebrities. Adolescents are the future of the motherland, and protecting the physical and mental health of minors is related to the vital interests of masses, the Press and Publications Administration said in a statement. It is similar to a campaign by President Xi Jinping to create a healthier society for a more powerful China. Under the new rules, the responsibility for making sure children play only three hours a day falls largely on Chinese gaming companies like NetEase and Tencent. Tencent's highly popular Honor of Kings mobile game is played by tens of millions across the country. Companies have set up real-name registration systems to prevent young users from going past game time limits. They have used facial recognition technology to confirm their identities. And they have also set up a program that permits people to report violations. It is unclear what punishments gaming companies may face if they do not enforce the restrictions. And even if such policies are enforced, it is also unclear whether they can prevent online addiction. Tao Ran is director of the Adolescent Psychological Development Base in Beijing, which specializes in treating internet addiction. He expects about 20% of children will find ways to get around the rules. If you have a system in place to restrict them from gaming, they will try to beat the system by borrowing accounts of their older relatives and find a way around facial recognition, Tao said. Short video apps such as Douyin and TikTok are also very popular in China. They are not under the same restrictions as games. Barry Ip of the University of Hertfordshire in England has researched gaming and addiction. He said it's just as easy for a young person to spend four hours on TikTok in the evening rather than play games if their time is uncontrolled. Lee, the father of two young children, said he plans to start piano lessons for his daughter. Sometimes due to work, parents may not have time to pay attention to their children, and that's why many kids turn to games to spend time, he said. Parents must be willing to help children cultivate hobbies and interests so that they can develop in a healthy manner. I'm Dan Novak. Thank you for that story, Dan. Ashley Thompson brings us our next story. People face cold, hunger, and danger when they flee their countries. 
They risk their lives to escape conditions such as poverty and war. About 4.2 million people around the world were reported as stateless, or not belonging to any country, at the end of 2020. But the United Nations Refugee Agency estimates that the true number is much higher. Here is a look at some of the struggles people leaving their homelands have faced in 2021 so far. In January, people in Bosnia took shelter in abandoned buildings near the town of Bihać. Some were fleeing conflict in Afghanistan. They tried to stay warm as they lined up to reach European Union member Croatia across the border. In February, police in Spain's North African territory of Melilla rescued people hiding in waste containers as they tried to make their way to the mainland of Spain. And the German ship named Sea Watch rescued more than 360 people from small boats off the Libyan coast. The central Mediterranean migration path south of the Sahara Desert to Italy is considered one of the world's deadliest. In March, worsening security and economic conditions in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador led to the biggest rise in the number of migrants at the United States' southwestern border in 20 years. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection officials dealt with 173,281 people from the southwestern border in March. The administration of President Joe Biden also attempted to deal with large numbers of children trying to cross the border alone. In May, Spain deployed troops to the Spanish territory of Ceuta in northern Africa. The troops guarded the country's border with Morocco after around 8,000 people crossed by swimming in or climbing over a barrier. Around two-thirds of the people who made it to Ceuta, including children who arrived alone, were expelled by Spanish officials. But many said they would try again to reach Europe. In June, thousands of Belarusians fled to Poland after a political crackdown by President Alexander Lukashenko. Nearly 10,000 Belarusians registered for humanitarian visas or asylum in the past year. Lukashenko, who has held power since 1994, won another election in 2020. Months of protests followed. Tens of thousands of people have been arrested for expressing their opposition to Lukashenko. In July, Afghans who walked through Iran for weeks arrived at the Turkish border to face a three-meter-high wall and other barriers. Turkish officials strengthened their efforts to block refugees from entering the country. Turkey detained 1,500 people near the Iranian border in a week, as violence rose in Afghanistan. In August, Greece completed a 40-kilometer fence, guarded by soldiers, on its border with Turkey. The barrier was built to stop asylum seekers from trying to reach Europe after the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan. And this month, more than 12,000 Haitians and others crossed the Rio Grande River from Mexico, where they were living in a camp under a bridge in southern Texas. Hundreds more continued to come to the border, leading to a humanitarian and political crisis for President Biden. U.S. officials began flying the Haitians in Texas, who entered the country without permission, back to their homeland. The operation may be the start of the country's largest expulsion of migrants or refugees in many years. I'm Ashley Thompson. Thank you, Ashley, for that report. Our last story comes from Dan Friedel. 
Evergrande is a big Chinese business that develops large buildings, such as offices, homes, and hotels. News reports note Evergrande owns more than 1,300 buildings in 280 cities. The company also has investments in an electric vehicle company, a media company, a soccer team, a food company, and other things. Evergrande borrowed money from banks and governments. It also sold investment products to average people to raise money for its projects. Evergrande agreed to pay interest on its debt. However, Evergrande recently sent letters to some governments and large investors saying it might not be able to pay back some loans on time. The Reuters news agency reports that Evergrande owes about $305 billion. This news made many banks and investors worry, because if Evergrande could not pay, they could not make payments on their own debts. When the news came out that Evergrande was uncertain it could meet payment deadlines, stock markets around the world went down, which shows how the financial problems of one very large company in China can cause problems around the world. The company's debt problem not only affects large banks and investors, it also affects regular people throughout China. A worker named Li Hongjun in the Chinese city of Suzhou is worried he will soon run out of food. That is because Li is working in a building owned by Evergrande and has not been paid since August. He said he will soon have to ask the government for help so he can buy food. Another person, Christina Shia, works in Shenzhen. She said she invested all her savings, nearly $60,000, into a fund or investment run by Evergrande. These funds are known as Wealth Management Products, or WMPs. She was promised a payment of about $4,600 earlier in September. It did not arrive. She said her investment was supposed to pay 7.5% interest per year. She planned to use the money to retire. Now it's game over, she said, adding that an investment manager promised the payments were guaranteed. People throughout China recently joined protests related to Evergrande's financial problems. They are angry that Evergrande was allowed to build so much debt without the Chinese government setting limits. Some people who purchased homes in Evergrande buildings are still waiting to take ownership. One woman, who did not want to give her name, said she has been waiting since April 2020. She said she is paying about $465 per month for a home she does not occupy. Research from financial experts at Capital Economics show Evergrande took in about $202 billion in payments from home buyers, but the company has not delivered 1.4 million promised homes and buildings. In addition, there are about 80,000 people like Chia who put money into Evergrande WMPs, about $15 billion over the last five years. They are worried about getting their money back. I'm Dan Friedel. Thanks again, Dan. Some content in this program was provided by the Associated Press or Reuters News Agency. And don't forget to join us again tomorrow 
to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Ana Mateo.